In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the in-game database as well as how you can access it from different ways. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and uh, edit an existing scenario that we created a little while ago, just for the purposes of kind of showing off some of the different ways to get to the database. So first things first, uh, whenever you're working with anything inside of the database, uh, you can always access any database entry by simply clicking on any of these blue links on any item you see on the screen. So for example, I noticed that um, I have a bunch of Tomahawk weapons here and I noticed it is hyperlinked. If I click on this, it will instantly open up a database viewer. Now note with the database viewer, if I select another item, it will actually open up a separate window if you need to uh, go ahead and purposely go through and start scanning through items. In addition to opening up a separate window, you can actually duplicate a window by pressing this button, which will get you a third window. You can have as many of these database windows open at any given time that you need to do so. The other method to access a database is to simply go to the top of the screen, Go up to game and then select the database viewer. Also note with the database viewer, if you're in a situation where, for example, I want to see browsing scenario platforms, I want to take a look at a ship, I can go ahead and double click on it and bring up its database entry as well. So one note about databases is to access a database, you're simply going to go up to editor, database, and then select the appropriate database you're going to be working. Keep in mind, whenever you change the database in a scenario, you completely have to restart the scenario unless you want to upgrade that scenario to a latest database version. Uh, note that there are two different types of databases. Uh, you have the Cold War database, which is basically from the end of World War II up through 1979. And then you have the database 3000, which will take you from 1979 basically all the way to the year 3000. If none of the databases you desire are here, you can actually load a separate database file by pressing that button, navigating to your database folder, and then selecting the appropriate database. It's worth noting that some of the older databases do not serve and have the same settings that some of the modern databases do. So it's very, very important that you keep that in mind. Keep in mind also, if you have databases from different versions of Command PE, they may not necessarily be compatible with each other. All right, now that you've selected the database that you need to do, simply go up to Game, Click on Database Viewer, and that brings you to the Database Viewing Screen. Now, the Database Viewing Screen is basically a glorified web page, if you want to think about it another way, that is able to reach into the database, which is basically a SQL database, and pull out the critical information and um, put it in all nice little pile. To select the type of item you're looking for at the top, simply click on the little button and then select the one that you're interested in. For example, let's say we want to take a look at chips. Now we can simply filter it by class. For example, if I want to type in a CVN, nuclear powered character, I can narrow it down by country. Let's say I want to select the United States. And I can even select whether or not the unit is a hypothetical unit or not. Note with hypothetical units, uh, they do exist and can be placed in the world. However, they didn't actually come into existence. So if I wanted to, I could select real life platforms only, or I could say only giving the hypothetical. And you can see this particular one here was uh, not actually made. It becomes a hypothetical unit based on what's going on right here. Now, the nice thing about this scenario is if I want to kind of clear out and start everything again, I can just close the window and go back up to the database viewer, and it resets all my options at the top of the screen. Now, the great thing, too, is uh, let's say I want to go see commercial, and I want to go ahead and I'll pick this aircraft, and I want to duplicate it from a separate window here. Now, notice it will forget what filter you had when you open the next window. However, it will remember what aircraft or option that you were looking at at that time. So now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the different things that show up in a database entry. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring this up. We'll get ourselves a pretty standard aircraft here. Obviously there's no a commercial version of the F-16CM that I know of. So we'll go ahead and grab ourselves a Block 50 from 2008. So when you open up any item in the database, it's gonna give you a couple critical pieces of information. The first one is what database ID number that particular item in the database is. If you're creating some kind of script that creates this unit or searches for this type of unit, you're going to need to know this number. Next, what you're gonna get is a long name version of the particular aircraft, as well as the country that it serves for, as well as the date. Some aircraft do not have a date, depending on what particular item that you're looking at. Scrolling down here, uh, depending on what they have available, they can go onto the internet and snatch you a nice little picture of it. Sometimes there'll be a detailed description. Again, this information is sourced off the internet. And then it brings you down to the general data page. On the general data page, it's going to give you all critical information, such as what category, what type, gives you the overall size, crews, empty weights, gives you the OODA cycle, which is basically going to be from the observe, orienting, deciding, and act, reaction time. It gives you the targeting. One thing you're going to notice about targeting is that it actually has multiple time amounts here. The reason for that is because this represents the skill of the crew of the aircraft. An ACE F-16 pilot has eight second time to target another aircraft or another target on the ground, I should say, or really any target. Now, if it was a novice 
F-16 driver, it would only take 20 seconds for them to acquire. This becomes very important. Evasion refers to how long it takes before this particular object can go ahead and take cover or start to maneuver. Over on this side, it gives you an idea of its size, which is critical for hangar spaces. Agility, which is a relative measure of its maneuverability and capability of pulling Gs. Its average climb rate, which is sustained. Its instantaneous climb rate right off of sea level, which is sudden. And of course, the takeoff and landing distance, cockpit visibility, armor, and how much damage a particular unit can take. Note when it comes to damage, uh, depending on which mode you have activated, if you have aircraft damage selected here, this will always make, take more than one hit if it gets hit for less than five damage points. If this option is not selected, no matter what damage points you have listed here, if the aircraft gets struck by something as small as a pistol bullet, it will be knocked out of action. Below that, you have any sensors and electronic warfare equipment on board with the name, the maximum range, what notes it is, as well as whatever abilities it has. Below that, you have anything listed for mounts, stores, and weapons. In this case, you can see we have a built-in M61A1 Vulcan gun, as well as some countermeasures. Down below, you have a list of aircraft stores. Uh, this is going to be a list of every store the aircraft can carry. Note that this group of items is going to be generated depending on what loadouts that have been designed inside the database editor. Uh, building things inside of the database editor will be covered at a later time. Each one of these is going to be a different loadout that this particular aircraft can be equipped with. It tells how long it takes to get that loadout ready. It tells us what the idea of that loadout is. And it also gives us an idea of what the weapon state is. Is it all night weather? What kind of range profile are we going to be dealing with, as well as the individual weapons. Now note, I actually have the ability, I'm going to go ahead and show you this real quick, I'll duplicate, scroll on down, I'll say I'm interested in the harm, if I click on that, that will open it up so I can actually take a look at the weapon entry for that particular weapon again. And again, the nice thing about the weapon entry is if you scroll to the bottom, it'll actually list every single carrier for that weapon as well. Scrolling down below the uh, loadouts page, we have everything we need as far as communications and data links. We also have signatures. Uh, signatures simply say what distance this particular object can be detected, or what is its relative detectability. In this particular case, if we're looking at it from the front, it takes us about two and a half nautical miles before we can see it. If we were looking at it from the back, however, you can see that this would also be about 2.46 nautical miles, unless you're looking at it on the infrared scale, in which case you're going to be looking at its engine exhaust, which gives it a tremendous 18 nautical mile visibility. There are also also some properties down here. Fly-by-wire simply improves maneuverability. Night navigation, it gives you what kind of advanced bomb site they're using. Helmet-mounted sight for dogfight purposes, and it also tells you the type of boomer fueling. Underneath here, you have what type of engine it has, the type of that engine, as well as how much speed it can achieve. It gives you some technical details on the thrust, as well as fuel consumption. And then it gives you an idea of how much fuel and speed you're going to get, depending on what throttle setting you're going to be using. At the very, very bottom, you have the total amount of fuel carried by the unit, not counting any fuel that it carries externally. When you switch over to ship, you're going to see things very, very similar. So for example, if I were to get a Tyco here, grab this 1991 version, it's going to be exactly the same. The only thing that's going to be slightly different here is you're going to notice that we have a capacity for cargo depending on what particular ship you're carrying here. It also is going to have information about a dock size, any relevant armor, which unfortunately we have none in this particular aircraft, and it's going to have all of the different sensors and electronic warfare possible on board. Notice you have everything from fire control radars, to multifunction radars, to all sorts of ECM as well as ESM capabilities. Any weapons available are all going to be shown down here, as well as if they can be directed by some kind of fire control system. Now, in this particular case, it also will tell you if it has local control in the event that the fire control system is knocked out. Scrolling below, you have the comms and data links. Aircraft facilities, assuming it can hold any aircraft. In this case, we can hold two medium aircraft. We also have our signatures, which for ships, you have an additional one as far as sonar. All the passive sonars are going to be the relative uh, loudness, if you want to think about it another way, amplitude if you prefer, as well as under active sonar, how easy it is going to be to detect, depending on what its orientation is to the detector. At the bottom of properties, we have all the different items as far as where it can refuel, where it can rearm. It's degaussed, making it more difficult for Alpha Warrants to detect it. We have our propulsion, as well as our top speed, and our different fuel consumption. And finally, we have our fuel. Note for this particular vessel, we have two different types of fuel on board on account of the fact we have the ability to service helicopters as well. The submarine database page is going to be relatively simple as well. Go over to, I'll do a type 2008. Oop, sorry about that. And we're going to make sure we get the one that I was looking for here. There we go. So with the submarine, it's going to give you the same basic properties as you saw on the other pages. The only difference here is you're going to have a slightly different amount of damage points. You're also going to have some displacement. 
crew, and you're going to have a new item for maximum depth available. All over there, same thing with aircraft as with ships. Scrolling down here, you can see it's everything from the different types of sensors, different types of tubes and weapons that are default loaded. Notice for this particular um, submarine here that by default, we have an SUT Mod 4 and not the Harpoon, although you may have a magazine on here, in which case you can see this particular ma magazine holds six backups with no Harpoons. So in the event that we did want to use this particular submarine with this particular weapon, we'd have to make a note on ourselves to go ahead and load it in later on. We have our communication data links. We have our signatures. We have any special properties, in which case uh, we have a snorkel. We have any types of engines. Uh, most, a lot of submarines on SSK, for example, here is both diesels as well as electric motors. We have all the performance details for the diesels and all the performance details for the electric motors stored separately. Notice with this one, it's still telling us how many um, milliamp hours we have for our battery. We simply have how many hours we can operate this particular unit at creep throttle, and you can simply work backwards from there. After the submarine page, we have the facilities. Now, it's worth noting that facilities really means two things in this version of command. The first thing are physical buildings. For example, if I typed in bunker, we get ideas of what the particular item is, but it also represents groups of vehicles. For example, if I wanted to take a group of uh, T-72 tanks. Uh, the key element to understand here is just like we have with ships, we have individual mounts representing individual vehicles, as well as if we don't have individual vehicles in group, again, I'll go back to our bunker real quick here. You'll notice it simply has a single item, in which case you have your sensors, its signatures, and anything important that it's going to be carrying underneath. Now note, if we had something that, for example, had its own built-in radar system, we'll go by the SA-6 real quickly here, you'll notice that it has multiple sensors, and we also have multiple vehicles available at this particular location. After facilities, we have ground units. Uh, ground units is a relatively new item that has just been introduced into Command PE. But these are individual units. Uh, for example, here I have my AAVP 7A1, and I can see all the details I need for this. Now think of a ground unit as separate from a facility, because a facility could represent a platoon, a ground unit will represent an individual unit, even as simple as a single infantry member here. One big thing that separates ground units from facilities, especially groups of vehicles, if you were to scroll down to the bottom, you're going to notice that there's a fuel entry now. Now, if we were to go back up to facilities, I'll go back up to my T-72 real quick here, you'll notice there is no plans for fuel down on this side. Now, this may change at time, but right now, that's how that is going to work. So that means, logistically, you need to be thinking about ground vehicles, everything need they have, rather than just having them as sort of abstract units. On the bottom, we have satellites, which basically gives us the ability to observe uh, different types of things from space. You have all of the different types of ones, and of course, we're going to go into satellites in a great more detail in a later video as well. But the important thing is, is they'll provide you with all the important sensors as well as detect abilities as well. Going to the very, very bottom, we have the weapons page. Now, the weapons here are anything that can be used, basically dropped or launched from any platform in the system. That means weapons are going to be including everything from 100 millimeter gun rounds up through uh, missiles, through torpedoes, through, uh, again, if I want to do an AIM-9, for example, you can see absolutely everything is going to be listed. The database page changes depending on the type of item that you opened up in the database. For this case, if I wanted to go to uh, take a look at the X2 here, this is considered a guided weapon, and it's going to have all all sorts of different properties on it, everything from weight to guidance to its uh, rate, basically its acceleration. It's going to have the appropriate launch altitudes, the appropriate target altitudes. It's going to have an estimation of its range as well as its pretend to hit. Uh, one thing worth noting here is the POH assumes that the weapon got to the target. If the weapon never gets to the target, for example, if the weapon is outmaneuvered, outflown, this never takes into play. It becomes a 0% chance. Now, notice coming down here, it has any sensors on board, has any communication data links. It has the signatures. Obviously, missiles are very small and difficult to notice. Any special properties it has. It has the warhead, which is critical here because it tells us it does 3.3 damage, which means if we were attacking our F-16 from earlier, we'd still have two damage left unless we got a mobility kill. Below it, it tells us any valid uh, aircraft, helicopters, missiles, and guided bombs. It gives us the ideal uh, weapons release authorization, something we can change, but we'll take a look at a little later on. It also tells us our boost, which is very interesting here. This particular the one will get us all the way up to this speed, and it will then cruise for a total of 38 seconds before the uh, battery goes out and the weapon self-destructs. We also have a pretty good idea of the performance of this particular weapon based on what altitude it is operating at. Now, if we scroll from weapons, I will take a look at something a little more conventional here. You'll also notice 
we have the ability to use drop tanks, which are basically going to tell us how much the range is extended at cruise power for this particular unit. Now, if we were interested, we could go select on the unit itself, go bounce back to it, and actually measure this a little bit more accurately if we're trying to calculate the exact amount of fuel it has. Uh, keep in mind, if we have something that's a conventional weapon too, let's say I'll go ahead and pick a 100 millimeter, for example, it will tell us exactly how much damage it causes, its rough accuracy, its chances of hitting an air target, which is going to be very, very low, as well as everything along those lines. Now, if I wanted to, we could take a look at a torpedo. Oh, there's the Mark 46. Delightful. So we can see here that it's going to give us everything from a different launch statistics, as well as its percent of hitting a hit, as well as its kinematic range versus its normal range if you're using a high-speed torpedo. Because we have the two speeds on this one, you can go ahead and take a look down here to calculate exactly what the difference is going to be between those two. So that's it for the database as far as how you can access it, as well as what it shows you.